Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fielka. Today is May 10, 2022. We want to thank Rob Grant and his amazing podcast, I'm Probably Wrong About Everything. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with Janet Fitch. Where are you calling in from, Janet? From Los Angeles. How cool is that? The first question is, is what is the best thing for a human being? Oh, wow. Um, you know, someone to love and something to do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Someone to love and something to do. That is productive. I love both those verbs. <laughs> Loving and doing. Um, what's your favorite form of information, how it comes into you? Oh, that's interesting. I got to say, hearing it from somebody else, mouth to mouth. Mouth to mouth. Yeah, that we call that direct experience sometimes. Why do you think humans collect or gather information? Um, because survival is so much easier when you know stuff. <laughs> when, you can predict, when you can predict at least the direction that stuff will come towards you. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, yeah, it, just to get on top of the incoming a little bit. I like that. You know, 80% of people go survival, but you put it, survival is easier when you know stuff. And that's that's a beautiful attitude. Now, do you think this need or want to collect information is more innate or more invented? I think that the human being is a monkey and monkeys are just innately curious and yeah. they'll just get into everything and they want to yeah. see how it works and they break stuff open. And we yeah. are so monkeys. <laughs> do thoughts create emotions? Oh, absolutely. Thoughts create emotions and then emotions create thoughts. Yeah. Round and round. You know, if anybody's got caught in that wash cycle, they can figure that one out. It's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, thoughts create emotion um, pretty quickly. Is thinking more innate or more invented? I think... I think thinking <laughs> is more recent, is a more recent development. I think that, uh, you know, cortical activity, I mean, that kind of prefrontal uh, uh, conscious thinking uh, is later and instinct reaction is very early. You know, it's like when the saber toothed tiger is coming after you, you don't want to have to think about it. You know, right. you just react. So yeah. reaction is very early. And I think thinking comes a lot later. I don't know what I think until I fill in the blank. Right about it. Yeah. Well, you know, I got, <laughs> I got that from McLuhan says, I don't know what I think until I say it. Joan Didion says, I don't know what I think until I write it. Yeah. 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 I say a lot of stuff. <laughs> but what I really think comes out when I'm writing. Well, that's, uh, uh, I'll go off script. There's a bumper sticker in my neighborhood. It says, don't believe everything you think. What do you think of that bumper sticker? I think it's absolutely true. I yeah. I can just remember so many times in my life where I had ideas about stuff, about situations I had never been in. And then when I was in those situations, it was like, oh my God, this, <laughs> you know. What was the point in having such <laughs> developed, I you know, ideas about this when I had no idea what it would be like <laughs> to be there? So, um, yeah. Janet, can humans think without language? I think the reactive mind thinks without language. I think it's impulse. It's it's chemistry, it's impulse, it's image. Image is faster than language. 
um, coyote, where's the cat, you know, coyote, cat. And, and you don't really think of that in terms of language. Yeah. Chomsky says that a language is not just words. It's a culture, a tradition, a unification of community, a whole history of that creates what a community is. What do you do when language doesn't work, when language breaks down? I think that invention that's like the that's like the tide pools you know that's like where the ocean and the land meet that's where things are born you know uh i think when you when language breaks down is when invention begins and new new forms are generated you know i'm teaching a class uh this upcoming weekend on point of view and we're talking about you know, third person, he, she, but, you know, now people, they're using they. Now, how do you use they uh, in literature? That's going to have to be invented by the people to whom this is going to be native language. And we're going to see language because language has failed them, you know, and failed us in a way that we couldn't even see, you know? So that's where the invention begins. Beautiful. You are truly a wordsmith and I appreciate it. And we're going to get into exactly. So much what... fun. Always. This is always fun. Talk, <laughs> well, talking to you is always a trip. Well, thank you, Janet, because um, you, you must have ESP because you really anticipated a couple questions down the line, but let's stay on script for a second. Is uh, your observations of humans in general, I know it's both and it depends. Are humans more feeling beings or more thinking beings? I think, <laughs> I, I conjecture that feeling is older than thought. So feeling first. And then thought, some people have that ability and some people don't. Some people are still with the old school. Yeah. Well, that's good because, you know, again, like 80 to 90% of people go, I think we're more feeling beings. They literally say, I think we're more feeling. And my one friend, my one friend always switches it. He goes, I feel we're more thinking beings. <laughs> my husband is a comedy writer and he always says that, um, that uh, life is a comedy for those who think and a tragedy for those who feel. <laughs> yes, that's good. Yeah, and um, I, I, one other thing about that is you can't separate thinking from feeling. They're like this, but since we invented the words, we can. But, you know, in essence, it's really... Impossible, but it's actually leads right into these two Alan Turing questions. Is thinking a function of the soul? It's interesting. Um, my conception of the soul is where it's like the again you know we're talking about the tide pools you know the place where the water meets the land you know the soul is where earth the material human being and the spiritual human being meet and it's muddy and it's generative and it's feeling primarily um you need the material to have a body to feel with, and uh, you need the spiritual that enlivens that mud or whatever. And in the middle is the soul. And I think the soul expresses itself in emotion, you know, yearning, uh, restlessness, uh, despair, all that stuff. You know, that's the soul. Um, and then we search for language, I think, to express those feelings to others. Really well put. In the second Turing question is, can machines think? 
I guess they're thinking these days, you know, if they can think without without being told what to think, that's independent thinking. I think they they are thinking. Um, they're thinking a lot of stupid stuff because <laughs> <laughs> they don't have soul. You know, they're not soulful. They don't have, a, you know, a, you know, a, an emotional center. They don't have any earth, you know. It's all metal and air. Um, well, they, that was beautiful. Yeah, you, how you brought it back to the first Turing question. You said, yeah, they they don't have soul in their thinking. Right. Yeah. Do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? That's a good question. I think that meaning arises. I don't know that we really pursue pursue it. So I would more I would probably pursue happiness, but meaning it's like I wait for meaning. I it bubbles up from below. I don't think you can pursue it. I think you can be open it's more it requires a receptivity rather than activity. That's good. You you use the very verb I'm going to use in the next question, but I have to add one little thing. Is, We're, tracking. We're tracking. Yeah, no, that is, that is totally. Be, um, but it's, I got the question from Viktor Frankl because he says that meaning lasts and happiness doesn't necessarily last. Right. Yeah. So does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness? Like is consciousness there bubbling away and we're detecting it or are we creating it? Hmm. I think consciousness is, it's inherent in the structure of the physical brain. I think that um, it's something about the way we've, the brain has evolved, that consciousness is, is inherent inside the physical structures. Yeah. What's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? Oh, thought. Dang, there's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions, but that one you got right. Thank you. <laughs> I think so anyway. Yeah. I, I, um, because... It does take some speed to uh, move at the speed of light. It's still, the sp you know, physical, whereas yeah. thought, I think, is is or image, you know, it's it's a uh, it can be instantaneous. Yeah, I agree. Audre Lord, the poet, said, "You can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools." Yvonne Rayner responded, and "said You can if you expose the tools." Basic question is, what new tool do you suggest? But just to put it into context, the word new is up to you. It's basically what tool do you gravitate towards? And some of these questions I open with a cute quote. It doesn't mean you put the, the, the quote. It's it, You put it in the context you want. So you can... Can you tear down the master's house using the master's tools? Yeah. Um, I think that there, the tools are belong into the belong to a wider category. Yeah, you know, it's like if they've built their, you know, if the master builds their house with lies, you know, can you take it apart with lies? Yeah, maybe, but you can take it apart with language. Yeah, so that's a larger subset you know, yeah. of lie. I mean, that's, I think that's where we're at. It's like yeah. they've built this house, you know, then they keep building it. They're adding wings. They're adding whole compounds to the lie house. Yeah. And um, I don't think we can take it apart with lies. Yeah. But we have to use language because yeah. the it's, you know, the habit of using language in that 
you know, really cynical way that's just got to be blown out of the water. And you can't do it with anything but the language. Yeah, it's really good. George Lakoff, the neuroscience guy, uh, linguist, says you got to use the existing tools and invent new ones. You can't abandon all the old tools, you know. Right. Right. Because that's what we're made of. You know, we're yeah. made of that, too. Yeah, I like Lakoff. He's such an interesting thinker. Yeah. What new toy do you suggest? What new toy do you gravitate towards? Oh, boy. Have I found any new toys? I, you know, everybody's like, oh, you should try this app. You should try that app. And I'm like, app, app, you know. <laughs> who, who cares about that? And then you find something that's like, it listens to bird song and tells you what the bird is. I'm addicted to that. The oh, Cornell, wow. really? Cornell ornithology app. Yeah. Oh, no. That, uh, cause I never can see a bird. You only hear it. And then it's like, but they have specific songs and stuff uh, that I just, I'm crazy about that. Um, that is cool. Yeah. New Most toys. I need to be more open to new toys. I remember the last time I was super impressed with a toy was, um, was um, going on, I was on book tour in Europe and I saw years ago, I saw somebody with a cell phone that opened like this, you know, the, the Star flip. Trek flip yeah. phone. I was just like, must have that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I got a good garlic. There's a new garlic kind of, instead of garlic press, it's like a, sh a curve and then a honeycomb cutout in the middle of metal with sharp edges that you put over the garlic and rock it. And it chops up the garlic for you. That's a little gadget. My mother was a huge gadget fan. I I'm like not a huge gadget fan, but that was... Um Every once in a while, you find something that's just like the greatest. Um, but that, new that toys. The, well, well, that ran the spectrum. Let's go with that. The bird <laughs> app and the garlic press. <laughs> and what do you worry about when you go to bed at night? Oh, uh, sanity. <laughs> mine, <laughs> mine, the people closest to me, and then the world. Sanity. Oh. It's just like we're just everybody is just losing their minds, losing <laughs> their minds. And I, I just worry about that to waking up in the middle of the night and having to go sleep in my office. Just yeah. <laughs> what can um, we do to yeah. maintain sanity? Well, there is a great McLuhan line. You can't prove you're sane unless you got discharge papers from a mental hospital. And that's just... <laughs> at that moment <laughs> right Look, I've, got, I've got them on my wall saying, they discharged me i know you know it's like so, a covid test you know you're you're negative right now <laughs> yeah for a couple between here and the dark so McLuhan also learned from the poet ezra pound that artists are the antenna of the race they're broadcasting and detecting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions so that we may learn how to cope with what we don't like about these inventions. So Jan, I, I asked you the same question Marshall probed his whole career. Why do we ignore, why do humans ignore the hidden psychic effects of our inventions, even though the artists are broadcasting them to us? And you know, by artists, I mean poets, writers, filmmakers, the whole thing. Why does the culture ignore what yeah, the why canaries we, in the coal mine? There are you go. That trying is, to tell us. Yeah. Um, one of human one of you know, our strengths are our our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses, yeah. and vice versa. You know, yeah. they come together. But the human capacity for denial is extremely strong and it enables us to live under very difficult circumstances we just pay attention to what's right in front of us you know day in the life of ivan denisovich a good day was getting a fish head in his soup um human beings are very good at denial 
we, the antenna, are not as good. So that's why we're like sleeping on the couch in the middle, you know, not able to sleep in the middle of the night because we don't filter very well. We, we're not good about being in denial, but most people are very good. And so when people say that terrible things are happening, most people just can't, they just don't, they can't go there. They don't want to be in that kind of a state of emergency all the time. And they just hear it. They hold it sort of like in like in RAM memory. It doesn't really write on the hard disk. They hold it there. And then they just go on with their lives as they had been. And and uh, and God bless them, you know, yeah. <laughs> that they can do that. I, I wish I could. It's, it's very interesting. It reminds me of someone told me once, rich kids start the revolutions because the poor people are too, too busy working to get their jobs and get their money and shelter. So the rich kids reads the books and then says, you've got to revolt. You've got to unionize, you know? And so um, it was interesting because um, the Black Panthers were uh, selling Mao's book in Berkeley. And they said, hey, we went to... Uh, Chinatown and bought Mao's little book for like a nickel. And then we sold it to all the hippie revolutionaries for five bucks. We eventually read it. It's a pretty good book. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think rich kids start the revolution. You know, <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I, I wrote my last books about the Russian revolution yeah. and the revolution Revolutions begin in with factors coming together. So yeah. they'll come together with people who have a program, different people, different programs, you know, will come together at a certain time where, you know, there's been a lot of pressure on society. Society is coming apart at the seams. Something has to be done. Everybody knows something has to be done. But revolutions are begun with people with their backs to the wall, you know, people who just can't take it anymore. Yeah. And the Russian Revolution began with on International Women's Day, um, 1917. The workers, it was during World War One. The workers, there was no food in Peter's St. Petersburg, Petrograd at the time. And uh the workers just, they needed to eat. Everything was going to the war, nothing for the civilian population. Uh, the women were just, couldn't make it. The soldiers' wives raising children, their husbands drafted and, you know, uh, at the front. And they needed more, you know, they needed to be able to, to eat. And the got to the point where the soldiers would not fire on the crowd. So re revolutions are begun more by desperation and then support of the armed forces. They turn to the people instead of their masters. Well, and then it's often taken over by people who have their own agenda. Yeah. And take it in a direction that the people who started the revolution never intended. That's tricky. Yeah. And you, know, you, you described somewhat resonated with me as like grassroots, but what's the difference between revolution and rebellion? Success. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Economy of words. Thank you. Okay. So back to artists. Um, do artists have a moral obligation? I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think they have any kind of anything across the board. I think um, they're, if they have any moral obligation, it's to be an honest artist. Yeah to really dig down, you know, to really get to the layers of 
under the layers, you know, go as far as they can uh, with their own materials and what concerns them. Well, that's good. How about Proust's question? On what occasion do you lie? <laughs> oh, you want me to out myself? Oh, God. <laughs> um, in real, I don't lie on the page. I just can't. That's where the, you know, uh, in real life, I like to be, cheer, you know, cheer people up. Yeah. You know, I like to cheer people up. I like to smooth over our differences if I can, yeah. you know, I don't like to pick fights. I, you know, yeah. if I, if you have a new dress that you're super excited about, I'm not going to say that is the ugliest dress I ever saw you in. <laughs> I'm going to say, wow, that look how happy you are. That dress makes you, <laughs> look beautiful, you know, that's good. I'm not going to tell you your hair. What do you think of my haircut? It's like, it's too yeah. late now. <laughs> you can't say it's too late now. <laughs> you know, they, they asked that. They'll grow out. They'll go out. They asked that at the, um, the last page of every Vanity Fair, and they asked this one woman in, uh, they said, what occasion do you lie? And she goes, that's called manners. And I thought that was interesting how you, you worded that. Yeah. Janet, are you more afraid of new ideas or more afraid of old ideas? Hmm, that's interesting. I don't know that I've I'm afraid of ideas. Yeah. I'm more afraid of people. <laughs> <laughs> people with ideas. People with <laughs> Both <that>. new and old. <laughs> Can you conjure up your earliest memory ever or one of them? Okay. Um, I can remember two extremely early memories, one of which was, um, um, just visual, a visual that I can remember, um, a, uh, like a press board, press board birds, uh, above my crib on the wall, like bluebirds. Yeah. And I do remember my mother uh wasn't a very good mother especially with little tiny kid and uh she used to in when i grew up you could put a kid in a playpen which they don't do anymore now they childproof the house so the kid can run <laughs> around there they just put you in a playpen which is basically a prison on wheels and you know she used to stick me in a back room in a playpen and just leave me there <laughs> <laughs> so I remember that really, really clearly. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? I ask myself that. I'm writing a, a about memory. My new novel is about memory. And it's particularly about um, what happens when you lose memory. You know, people who are going into dementia. Um, I don't know if you've known anybody who's gone through this, but and see them forget all the all that crankiness and all the things that they wouldn't do and that they didn't like and you know all that stuff and suddenly they become really nice you know they I, you know they forget that they don't like this and suddenly they like it and it's just like and then you think gee you know is is how much of personality or character is refusal. You know, I refuse to like, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't do this. I don't. And then as soon as you lose memory of who you are, you know, in dementia, you know, you're more open to actually enjoying the moment as it is. Um, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I think that memory is, In that way, it's it's kind of a curse because you're you're operating on the past instead of on the present moment. But on the other hand, in a societal way, you know, memory is important because yeah. you have to know why you are where you are 
I, when I was in college, I, I was, I was, uh, 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 I was a history major. And I remember this senior who I re very much admired, she was a philosophy major, asked me, why do people study history? You know, it's just a catalog of wars and kings and who gives a crap about that? And she was so smart and it just drove me crazy trying to figure out how to answer her. Um, and I realized that if a people doesn't know their own history, you can do anything you want with them, which is why our current right-wingers are trying to remove history. They're trying to remove, you know, the history of slavery. They're trying to remove the history, you know, history of colonialism. They're trying to relieve, remove the history of our legal precedent, you know, yeah. um, and we can, you know, so that in that sense, memory will save us. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. It is. You, you, you suss that out really beautifully. And um, can you tell me someone within your immediate family that had an impact on you, sort of like a role model? And then outside your immediate family, just briefly, and what specifically was that impact? Well, in my immediate family, I got to say my husband is so different from me. He's so calm. He's so, he's a comedy writer. He's very funny. And he has had a tremendous uh, effect on me of chilling me out, you know, that things are not always so desperate. You know, I thought my life was a tragedy, but it turns out it's a comedy. <laughs> nice. And that's that I learned that in very late years, you know, so that was a huge effect. And then who had the biggest effect on me? Not a family member. Yeah. Um, Excellent therapist, excellent therapist, uh, and I'll say uh, Kate Braverman, who was uh, oh. my writing teacher and a, an amazing, amazing, amazing person. Very, very um, intense and very uh, contradictory and lots of ups and downs, but a huge, huge impact on me. Yeah. Did your parents raise you a particular religion? We were Jewish, uh, but my mother uh, was very, very anti-religious. She uh, grew up in Hollywood in the 30s, 20s, 30s, and uh, Jewish family, you know, Jewish on both sides. But it was very secular, and there's sort of a there was a sort of floating anti-Semitism in Hollywood at the time. And uh, so they were very careful to be Americans. You know, they celebrated Christmas. They, you know, dressed up. They had, my mother loved to make you an Easter basket, super into it, you know, always had a Christmas tree, loved, did not want to know anything about Judaism. Her mother um, was somebody who decided that she she was raised Orthodox and decided as a, you know, 12 or 13 year old that um, uh, she was not going to, she didn't believe in any of that stuff. So she passed that along. Uh, my father was raised Orthodox in a time where there wasn't even a word Orthodox. You were Jewish, you know, so you were Orthodox. <laughs> and, uh, but he, it, he, it wasn't intrusive to him. You know, yeah. so he lived with this very secular person, and that was fine with him. So I didn't know anything about Judaism until uh, I had a kid of my own. And then it was like, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to celebrate, continue the Christmas, weird Christmas thing? Or are you going to find out a little bit about your own religion? You know, so we decided to find out a little bit about, about things. Do you pray? I'm, I, I don't pray. I have, I'm a Qigong practitioner and I try to harmonize with the Qi field. 
That is great. Arm so rock. that's the, you know, so if somebody is in trouble, you know, if I have somebody who, if I was more of a deist, you know, I would might pray to a yeah. deity, but being more of a, on the Qigong side of things, I tend to just try to breathe some space around that person. I try to, you know, kind of wrap them in some kind of energy, you know, that more on that level. Beautiful words. <laughs> um, no, that's really well put. I loved it. Uh, if God does exist, what would you like God to say to you after you die? I just can't even picture that situation. Um, <laughs> that okay. there would be a deity who would speak <laughs> to me. I, I have more, you know, I, I could e more easily picture loved ones on the other side who've passed on meeting you. You know, nice. that I seems that. to be a common thing for people. Uh, near-death experience, you know, that somebody comes to meet you on the other side. Uh, what I would like God, I can just, I don't feel the deity like that. You know, I feel like we're all like little drops of water and we go back to the sea. You know, what would you like the sea to tell you? Welcome yeah. home. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like Rebecca Solnit says, just because I asked the question, just because you asked the question doesn't mean that I have to answer it. But see, you you really did well with that. You put it in you metaphor, you you put it as a metaphor in that sea and in breathing. Beautiful. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Huh. I never thought of that. I think people who believe in Satan would say that, you know. Um, does evil Evil exists. People, there are people who have a natural predisposition towards cruelty and uh, sadism. I think. Yeah. Well, it goes along with. How do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And I'm going to set it up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK says, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. The basic question is, Janet, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you react to the Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. I think that good sense should prevail. <laughs> you know, if you know somebody <laughs> doesn't like you, you know, um, it's good to know. It's good to know and just keep it in mind as you deal with that person. You know, yeah. that this is a person who's done you dirty and maybe they don't even know that you knew. Yeah. And you just, uh, being polite, cordial, you know. Nice. But always knowing that you know, this is a person who, uh, you know, always being very careful with that person and knowing, you know, don't trust them at all, ever. Oh, hi, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Cool. I like that keeping them close, you know, keeping yeah. an eye on them is not a bad idea. Yeah. You know, further alienation is not necessarily a good idea, you know. That's good. I live in a small town. I was the newspaper editor in a small town newspaper. And the first, when I first lived there, I, I couldn't believe how friendly everybody was. They knew you, they knew your name. Hi, you know, it's like, wow, everybody's so nice. And then I realized like the second year that just because they knew you didn't mean they liked you. <laughs> and then I learned that you'd come across people in a small town, you come across people over and over in different contexts. And just because 
you were really pissed at them about this thing with the little theater or something that actually when it came to protesting the you know clear cut they were right up front you know so you learn not to like never deep sick someone because you never know you you never know that people have their goods the people you think are the worst people have a good might have a good side you know so don't completely write people off either yeah that's uh... avoid them avoid them if you you know if you live in la it's like <laughs> never see you again <laughs> well it's, you evoke two uh thoughts um American Indians indigenous say your enemy is your best teacher, or not maybe best, but you can be a teacher. Right. And then Ram Das had a great one back a couple of administrations ago. He says, I'm having a real hard time loving George Bush. And it's like fill in the blank. I'm having a real hard time loving Putin or whoever you want to fill in. Like what, what does hating do in the long run, you know? It's yeah. I think that the the Buddhists are very into learning from your you know your worst enemy is your best teacher because they're all about uh, not clinging to your suffering and all yeah. that. Um, I um, I try not to hate people. you know they say don't hate people, hate what they do right. Um, you know, when it comes to people who are destroying the lives of countless people, you know, it's like whatever you call it, hate or just a fond wish that they would disappear. Um, yeah. yeah, the forgiveness is not my strong point. You know, I think it's because I'm a history person. Forgiveness is really hard for me. I, I tend to try to come to some accommodation with that person, but I'll always remember what they did. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Mark Twain said, forgiveness is the scent the flower gives off when the foot steps on it. <laughs> <laughs> How <laughs> oh, good, good luck, yeah, it is. But uh, fill in the blank. Anger can be a productive emotion when there are times that anger is just an honest reaction to what has what's occurring, and you know, to use that in a, you know, towards some kind of positive resolution. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's absolutely, it's part of it. It's part of the human piano, you know? And I think that to single it out and say, oh, that's bad. You can't have anger. You can't have, you know, it's like we have, we're here to play the whole piano. It's just when people get stuck on that one key, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You are a. I'm going to cop so many of your lines and put them into my act, man. These are great. I love <laughs> Could you get off that one key? <laughs> okay. James, James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin over 100 years ago. He basically checked out. He said, This is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, Sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to re recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? The, uh, you know, it's about being able to turn it around, turn it over, examine it from different angles only art can do that you know when you yeah. when things are happening in life they usually happen too fast and it too big too fast to have a moment to think about it it just whereas art gives us a moment like pulls us out and says okay let's let's take this phenomenon and let's create a, an object or, you know, a work of art that then 
it's like asbestos gloves. You can handle something that's otherwise too hot to pick up and turn it this way and look at it and think about it and think, what do I really think about this? Whereas in life, you, you don't have a moment, you know, it just keeps coming. Beautiful. What, what do you think the motive of the cave artist was? The mode? The motive. You know, um, like, you know, the anthropologist. Yeah. Said it the, for the years. Right. First the motive. In this movie. But I mean, just your hunch. What do you think the cave artist motive was? Honestly, boredom. <laughs> boredom and Matt and kind of mastery you know the noticing i can do this yeah. i can do this thing i'm bored i'm sitting here in the freaking cave it's a, <laughs> you know it's enough already you know i can depict what interests me i can depict i can i can draw a deer i can draw a bear they say that some of it could be magic yeah. you know summoning the animals you know, it could be appreciation, just what could be more beautiful than a herd of deer that I can hunt yeah. or just what could be more beautiful. You don't see trees. You see animals. They're very yeah. involved in the animals. Um, they're, you know, they, every animal has, they can really borrow the power of a bear, you can't get close to a bear, but you can draw it on your wall and, and be in the presence of that bear. Yeah. So I think there are three different reasons for that. Really well put in. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like uh, this guy uh, a couple of months ago, I says, what was the motive of the cave artist? And he says, to keep people in the cave. <laughs> like, come on over to my cave. Now stay here. Look at my walls. But <laughs> it's part of your word mastery that I like because it's like, you know, I've got this great uh, drawings on my cave walls, but the Balinese have no word for art. They do everything as well as they can. Right. So that's interesting. Like they didn't go, well, I'm an artist and I'm a hunter. They were just probably doing this stuff and they didn't. And to show off that they had some chops, like I have art skills, you know, but they That's didn't. Right. It's like kids. They don't go, I'm an artist right away. They just start scribbling, right. you know. And in a society where everyone is an artist, like in Bali, it's like you're a human being. Of course you make art. But yeah. then again, there are some some people are just better. Yeah. And yeah. maybe in those primitive societies that made those cave paintings, I don't think they let just anybody draw those. I think there was somebody who was particularly good at it and then taught people how to do it. You know, the first person who figured out how to represent uh, a living animal as a uh, picture. I mean, wow. those are beautiful. You know, it's not just stick. It's not a, a diagram, you know. Yeah, it's beautiful. Now, Janet, you've covered your background in your pursuit of being a writer so well in so many good interviews on your website, in fact, and all over YouTube. I'm not going to ask you that question. You've covered it well. But I'm going to ask you instead, what first attracted you to pursue history as a study, like the tipping point? And then what first attracted you to pursue teaching? You know, the tipping point, like I want, you know, cause you sort of said, you know, Anais Nin and various, these things happen in your life. So let's do the history and the teaching. Um, well, history, just the, you know, story, it's story, the story of outsized, characters and past uh, past times an awareness that this too will be a past time at some point yeah. you know preservation i think is very important to me um history i was always interested in reading historical fiction and reading about times past and people 
past, um, the preservation of the past interests me. So that it's a, uh, on a certain level also storytelling. Yeah. So as a writer in hiding, you know, a, you know, as a fiction writer in drag, his, you know, the writing of history really was very similar, except that it had to be true and researched and peer reviewed. And ultimately, I really wanted to make it up more. Yeah. Um, and then teaching is, it's like writing in the sense that to teach a course, um, I don't know what I think until I write about it, until I teach it, until it's like I'm putting together this class on point of view. And it really made me go back and think about the earliest kinds of stories and what point of view did they use uh, in early storytelling and the Thousand and One Nights and, and uh, fairy tales. And then you get into you know, the first written stuff, you know, Cervantes and Tale of Genji and, uh, you know, Tristram Shandy and, you know, how, what is that point of view? I mean, it gives me, um, uh, it gives me the kind of the time and the impetus to do, uh, to research deeply into something that I would not normally have time to do. Yeah. So a screenwriting teacher told me great film, great art, great novels. When you can clearly see the intention of the maker, Kubrick says the opposite. Great art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process when you're writing a novel? Oh, that's such a good question. I am somebody who does not start with intention. I'm somebody who starts with a character or a situation. And I usually don't know why I am drawn to it until I'm deeply into the project. And then I go, oh my God, of course, you know, that's why. Um, so intention is something that I'm sort of stupid that way. It's like a, I go with kind of the the shape of people and their reactions and the pressure on them and then only gradually does the intention for the work or the shape of the work or the reason for it emerges so don't start with it wow and then uh marcel duchamp said there's no art without an audience how much are you thinking of your reader while you're writing your novel I think about my reader in terms of the fact that somebody is going to be giving me their time and their attention, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And you want to make it worth their while. Yeah. You want to really give them something. Really, you know, so that, that when they finish your book, they've had a nutritious meal. You know, that it's fed them in some way, not just, it's not a bag of Doritos that, you know, it's a well-crafted bag of Doritos. They eat it and it's like, throw the wrapper away and on to the next thing. You really want them to savor it and feed them, you know, and feed their, feed their souls and, you know, stir, to stir up their moral sense, to stir up their, you know, the asking of big questions. Um, to make them also feel seen that this, you know, to show them an experience that maybe they have experienced. So we don't feel so alone that people have been there also been there. Other people have been there. Yeah. I love that commonality thing. McLuhan says that we invent things to extend our humanness, human sensoriums. I like to call it humanness. So like knife and fork extends our teeth, clothing extends our skin. The uh, philosophy, philosophy or religion might be an extension of consciousness. 
What does the writing utensil extend for you? What humanness, whether it's the pen or the keyboard? It, it concretizes thought. It concretizes memory. They tend to disappear. I'm like somebody who doesn't have that good a memory. Um, experience just flows through. I'm good at being in the present. Experience flows through unless this is extended and yeah. it is put down. And then it more it exists more firmly than if you know, then some fleeting thought that goes through my mind. Yeah. Is storytelling more innate or more invented? Innate. Oh my God. I, I storytelling is innate to the human being. Yeah. You know, we have to retell, tell and retell and retell, you know, um, somebody who has, you know, I can't think of a culture that doesn't have story. Um, yeah. I can't think of a kid who doesn't, won't stop to listen to his story. What's the function of poetry? I think that poet the function of poetry is is it's where language and um the world come together in the closest harmony you know where they experience and um and language you know, they will, where they dance together. It's beautiful. Dan, you know, uh, Gary Snyder, nature poet, beat poet says, my task as a poet entails seeing the world without language, then putting that seeing into language. Yeah. Yeah. William Carlos Williams said that observation is the first act of the imagination. So I what, I teach a whole class on writing from the senses. And the first thing you do is you have to teach people how to see, how to hear, yeah. how to touch, you know, how to be curious and explore and really observe the world because people are way too introverted. They're way too, you know, they think about their thoughts, you know. They look at screens very flat, you know, and pre-digested material, you know, and just to tear, and these are writers, you know, just to tear them out from their screens and make them go outside and smell dirt, touch yeah. a tr touch five different tree trunks and tell it, describe each one, you know, like live in the world. I think we're starving for that. It's really good. I saw parents walking down the street the other day and their kid was pointing. And I thought he was like pointing at a billboard or something. And then I looked and he was pointing at a butterfly. And oh. the, par the parents were really stopping it. And it made me look like, what is he pointing at? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was quite amazing. I've been, I've driven on a, uh, driven a friend on a, a, uh, uh, in my car and seen a hawk, like I'm one of those people I see hawks. Yeah. See, that's hot. I said, and I go, hawk. And they were, <laughs> and they're going, where? They're looking at the road. <laughs> it's like, it's up in the air. It's a freaking <laughs> hawk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like, uh, uh, oh, you know that. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, it reminds me, yeah. Um, Richard Brodigan said, Richard Brodigan said, everyone has their roles in life. Mine is clouds. That's a good one. That's like, oh, because my parents taught me, like, you don't, you know, art museums are great, but you can just stare at the sky and look at the clouds, and there's a moving art exhibit for you all day, you know. 
<laughs> it's pretty amazing. But this guy just died. He was a, a lit crit, Leo Bersani, and he wrote on Mahler May, the great uh, symbolist poet. And he said, the very crises which threatens the writing of poetry sustains poetic composition. I'm curious of your take on that, because I'm always trying to figure out mm -hmm. what exactly he's getting on, because yeah. I think fill in anything, the very the very crisis which threatens the writing of a novel sustains the novel, c composing a novel. So I don't know if he, it means yeah, exclusively poetry, but just the idea he's sort of... I think that one way of looking at that, and certainly not the only way, is is the level of irritation in life that you need a certain amount of irritation that to react to. You yeah. know, it's like the pearl and the oyster. You know, you need a little yeah. bit of grit in there to yeah. keep you awake and make you want to and, and give you something to want to address. But yeah. too much of it, and you're just lying in bed sucking your thumb. Yeah. <laughs> And crying softly. <laughs> well, it, it, really, <laughs> it really leads into this one because um, a couple of my uh, film heroes, one says uh, his mantra is ignore yourself. And um, another one says there is no self-expression. And Cecil Taylor, the great jazz pianist, says, I'm just a vehicle and this stuff just comes through me. So I'm curious your take on this, Janet. Um, is art making, I know it's both and it depends. It's a stupid question, but do you get a general what, what we're talking about? Is art making more self-expression or more you're a vehicle for the, whatever technology, culture, or environment is currently present? I think that at when you when you really it's like most of work most of writing is craft most of writing is a conscious effort to you know pushing stuff up the hill um you know with all your intellect and all of your you know conscious faculties but sometimes the angels sing <laughs> Sometimes they sing, they use you as, you know, an instrument. And that is the, that's the thing you live for. Yeah. That's, it makes all the rest worthwhile. Yeah. So I would like to say that I'm a conduit, but I'm kind of a clogged up, you know, there's all these leaves and crud and mud and you know so good. they they would like to use me as a conduit but they're i keep you know it's like having to work with all this junk that yeah. is me you know and clear it away and you know work at it enough that maybe some angelic voice can come through me at some point that but was when beautiful. it's going well you're like you are miles davis you know yeah. Oh, I saw you mentioned that. That is so beautiful. And can art making be egoless? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's when you get rid of, when you break through the, you know, if you are a Jungian, you know, there's like a floor to personal consciousness and you break through that floor and you're down yeah. into the collective unconscious. And if you, whenever you can clear out the, all the mud and all that leaves and crap that we, we are, <laughs> you know, personally and get down into the big stream, that big underground river of the collective unconscious, then that's, that is selfless. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's, uh, putting the self aside and entering the life of everybody. Yeah. Well put. <clears throat> so Michael Abdett, I spoke with him 40 years ago and he made a documentary on a Russian rock star. And I says, why do rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? Most people don't know 
Abel Gantz invented rapid montage in 1922, but it really flourished in the 80s with MTV. Marty Scorsese says, I cut my films faster because of MTV. Michael said, it's because we've learned to take in information faster. So I ask this question with a bias. Can humans, can we literally learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe we can? We do, but to say whether or not that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a whole other deal, you know? Yeah, we can take in things faster. We can multitask. We can do all this stuff. Um, capitalism favors it, you know, always speeding up the speeding up the conveyor belt, seeing how fast, yeah. how much work they can get out of a single worker as fast as they can, you know. So I'm like a big believer in the um, opposite movement, you know, slow it down, slow cooking, slow. I love you know, slow, like things like, um, I can watch a Bill Viola video of somebody, you know, slowly diving into a pool. Um, you know, I can watch that stuff all day long. You know, I like to slow down. I like a big fat book, you know, be able to slow down and just read this, just Im absolutely immerse in that. Meditation is a, is a similar emotion. You know, I think that, that the human being needs to resist this cranking up, cranking up capitalist hyper productivity um, kind of thing and uh, see, just, you know, sit and look at trees, look at leaves shifting. You know, I think, you know, that's where the real joy of life is. Yeah. Yeah, the new George Carlin documentary is just about to come out. And um, I was lucky enough to work for him for a year. And he would say, um, whatever happened to letting kids stare out the window? <laughs> right. Instead of giving them something to oh, occupy you gotta, their minds. You got to yeah. go to uh, soccer now. You got to do this. You got to do that. Yeah. What's more important, conviction or compromise? I don't know. Conviction is such a feels better. You know, conviction is like from here out. You know, everything goes out. You know, I don't care what you think. I don't care who you are. I don't care where I am. I, you know, it feels really good. It feels powerful, much like anger. You know, it feels <laughs> great to feel right. You know, and, uh, but uh, compromise is recognition of others, recognition of material, of life in the material world, where uh, you know nothing is a hundred percent. Compromise, you can see it as like bumbling along, but say democracy, for instance. Um, in d dictator run uh, societies, totalitarian societies, um, you know, studying the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks were extremely scornful of democracy because it was so inefficient. And you have to listen to freaking everyone, blah, 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 bumble along, bumble, bumble, bumble. But that compromise is so much more fertile. The soil is so much more fertile there and it's slower and it's clumsy and it takes time and, you know, but it lasts in a way that, that, you know, it can see its own weaknesses. It moves slowly and there's something to be said for the inefficiency of democracy that had, you know, a dictator, can just say, you're dead, you're dead, you're doing this, you're moving here, you're doing this, you're marrying her, you're, you know, and it's all extremely efficient, but it's not, it's, it doesn't generate 
the pursuit of happiness, that's for sure. Because who cares about you? You're just a piece of the puzzle. You know, I think that only the compromise can embrace all the people. Yeah. So I'm kind of more on this. Isn't that horrible? But I have to say that I'm more on the side of compromise. Horrible. <laughs> That's the other one when people go compromise. They says, oh, there's no right or wrong answers. But that one you got right. Uh, literally, I'm fishing for people to say compromise. But 90% of people say conviction. It feels good to be conv and, and so is, convinced of your rightness. It seems like we're, we're already convicted. You come out and you're convicted. Compromise is hard and it's, I think, more essential. But again, that's just my bias. I like that. My favorite answer ever was, what's more important, conviction or compromise? The guy goes, depends on what you mean by important. Because, <laughs> you know, he right. took the two main topics and shifted it to important but that was beautiful no i really i i think it's it's um i was gonna follow it up with where did you get that the way your parents raised you saying compromise did you get that from more from the way your parents raised you on your own or somewhere else that's fascinating um my father was a more of a conviction person, but a very middle of the road kind of person, you know, not an extremist, but a very, you know, believed in America, believed in justice, believed in, you know, truth, believed in, uh, his values were very set. Uh, my mother was in politics. And so to her, it was all about getting to agreement with other people and forming some kind of consensus. You know, how do we um, meet your needs? How do we meet your needs? How do we get this through the legislature or whatever? Um, and uh, so her values, which might change over the decades, you know, she might move this way or that way. Um, but she got a lot of stuff done in her life, so. Well, it sounds like she taught you negotiation, which is part of compromise, like di diplomacy, negotiation, seeing the big picture. In fact, I've been dying to fit this word, this line in your teaching point of view. McLuhan said understanding is not having a point of view, which is an interesting thing because we think I have this bias or that. Now, he would say when you're in your lonely teenage room, you can go, I love Facebook or I hate Facebook. But when you're with one or more people, you should not, you should try to have what's called suspended judgment. If you don't say you love or hate Facebook, you try to figure out how it's shaping our behavior. You're going to get a comprehensive awareness, a big picture of how face, because it doesn't matter if you do Facebook or not. We live in a Facebook world, you know. I have people yell at me because they go, I messaged you on Facebook. Well, I have two or three Facebook pages, but I don't do Facebook. And they're like, well, I go, I tell them that. And they, they get mad at you. They go like, well, you should do. You it's know. very interesting. You know, this whole idea of not having an opinion. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's like, what is personality? You know, what is char character? Yeah. Character, is character just refusal? Is character saying, you know, I'm not this, I'm not that, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. Um, and does that prevent your enjoyment of life? Yeah. Because there's so many things that you have to remember that you don't like. Whereas if you, that was all washed away, and you didn't know what your preferences were, you know, wouldn't you be more curious? It's like, oh, it's like kids, you know, it's like they're smelling the farts in the bath. There's, you know, they're feeling the mud and they're, they, cause they're not prejudiced against, you know, they haven't decided yet that, oh, that's a bad thing. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do that's icky. You know, mommy is like, don't do that. That's icky. You know, <laughs> these kids don't know that it's icky. It's just interesting. You know? exactly. Well, that's again, this funny thing that McLuhan says, we we invented point of view when the artist 
started doing the vanishing point in paintings. Like you got a point of view that, that what, you know, how did cave people go? Well, the, the greens on radishes are bitter. They didn't have like, I, you know, like you said, characters refusal. Like, well, we throw that part out. We only eat this part because it tastes bitter. Cause I have a point of view. I have, you know, <laughs> it's sort of <clears throat> that thing that taste, the the taste word comes from, well, it's a gut feeling. Right. I have a gut feeling, you know. Right. Well, it's like um, in those personality profiles, the INJ. Yeah. D or, you know, those things. Uh, there, they have a different, there's the um, people who are, judgers and people who are observers right and everybody falls somewhere on that spectrum but as a definitely more of a judger than a you know on the judgment side of things sometimes right. i really make an effort to drive around and not have ideas about anything not label anything not decide if it's good or bad not have judgments about anything you see a lot more you yeah. observe a lot more when you don't just sum up somebody you know um you know stuck what... up homeless person you know yeah. overweight you know blah, blah, blah. but if you just look at everything and you're like oh that's an interesting person you know i wonder what he's carrying in that shopping cart you know it, it allows for more experience more it's the bigger picture yeah it's suspended judgment in fact that was a perfect example lily tomlin's and jane wagner's great line that the homeless lady's pushing the gro grocery cart down the street and they go people think i'm crazy for collecting this stuff what do you think of the people who actually buy it <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, I asked for 90 minutes. We got 13 minutes more. Can you go a little longer or you got to run? No. Okay. Fine. Just, just so I can, uh, I really appreciate this. Um, these three elements, how do you rate them? You've accomplished a lot. Luck, skill, and ambition. What played the biggest role second and third? I think ambition came first. Then skill then luck. Um, I think that, uh, um, but luck will always trump everything. Uh, I have, My favorite toast is uh, we drink to undeserved success. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what could be more wonderful? that undeserved success that you don't have to work for, that it's just given to you. So luck is always best. But I think ambition, in real life, ambition comes first. Yeah. The decision, the yearning, the drive to do something. Then you work to learn how to do it. And then if you're lucky, then something comes of it. Yeah. Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness. Tell me a weakness you turned into a strength. Oh, God. I think that in a bill, as a writer, when you over when you deal with your inabilities, you that often becomes your strength. But I don't yeah. know if that's an overcoming or not. Yeah. Um, I'd say anxiety is a my is my Achilles heel. But, but how does it help? That overactive imagination that goes with hyper anxiety is actually what that's how my books get written. Yeah. Cause I always imagine things. Um, yeah. So it's two sides. Yeah. 
Well, T.S. Eliot said poetry is outing your inner dialogue. What language is your inner dialogue in? Oh, wow. <laughs> what language is it in? It's sort of operatic. Oh, that is a great <laughs> It's sort of opera. <laughs> I, I don't think it's that. Italian opera, though. I love uh, that. My friend said that operas may they turn the banal into the epic. Yeah, yeah. I think that my internal dialogue is definitely uh, on the, you know, excitable side. <laughs> I got to tell you, this great uh, experimental filmmaker, um, Abigail Child, I says, what language is your inner dialogue in? She goes, I wish I knew. <laughs> wow. um, is perception reality? No. No, perception is that, you know, we're back to the tide pools. Yeah. You know, it's the interaction between me and the world. Yeah. Interaction. That's good. Why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? I'm not saying life is pointless. I'm just saying, why is it difficult for humans to consider that? I think it's because um, suffering is so much a part of life and pointless suffering is very hard to bear. Yeah. What's the difference between pain and suffering? Uh the Buddhists would say that suffering is the resistance to pain. That it hurts, you know, there's just pain, which has no meaning, speaking of meaning. Whereas suffering is resisting the fact that this ha is happening, which just adds, it just multiplies the pain. Yeah. Yeah. It's why it hurts more when somebody hurts you than it does if you just run into a wall or something. Yeah. You know? Lewis Carroll says, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? I think that I sometimes enjoy a little magical thinking that I know very well, you know, that I can't move objects with my mind, but I can't help trying. You know, I, I walk by, uh, I, I take a walk every morning and there are these, um, uh, in an area with big trees and, I, there are certain trees I kind of touch and commune with. And I know the tree doesn't care whether I'm there or not. <laughs> but I feel like we're communicating. <laughs> so I enjoy, I enjoy doing things that are meaningless. But nevertheless, you know, I can picture something that's impossible happening. I like that. Um, <laughs> What's well, that? I, I, I might. My Touch wife, a tree. What's yeah, no, my wife Susie would totally agree. She she cannot handle when they cut the trees in our yard, or she she's <sighs> she touches trees and believes it. And I'm like, hey, that's a growing in it. It has consciousness in its own way. But uh, you reminded me of Emo Phillips' great line. He's in front of a crowd and he says, "If you have tele 
kinetic powers raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that tell there is telekinesis. Yeah. All the I think we it's all the time. Yep. It's yep. happening all the time because somebody who I love can turn and look at me and make me feel good. Yeah. They're they moving objects at a distance. You know, yep. it happens every day, all day long. Oh, yeah. I think it's just being aware and open to it. You'll you can connect the dots all the time. Yeah. In fact, McLuhan called it conceptual. No, uh, McLuhan called it complex clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. And and Frank Zappa called it conceptual continuity. There's like mm -hmm. a thread weaving through everything. It's just you know how you want to connect it. So, Janet, you've been writing for a while. Tell me one major element that stayed the same since you wrote your first novel, you know, what your first writings, and one major element that's changed. I think what's ch changed is easier. So I'll start with that. Um, what's changed is when I started writing, I wrote because I wanted to make a mark. I wanted people to know that I was there. I wanted to force them to see the world through my eyes. There was a lot of, uh, rebellion, a lot of, you know, aggression, anger, um, and that has changed, you know, I write now more to see what I think, to understand what my concerns are, to give, you know, people a look at, at, um, at life in a way that might be, um, encouraging that could be beautiful things that they hadn't thought were beautiful. Um, you know, see if I can awaken sensuality, you know, I have so different reasons for writing than I had when I started. Yeah. Um, because I've become a different kind of writer. Um, thing, what has stayed the same is the joy of putting a words coupling them into um, these marks on a page and these clusters of marks and and forming a picture in somebody's head and that joy of doing that wow. um, that never has changed. That is beautiful. They asked Joyce once, uh, "How are you coming along with your book?" He goes. Oh, it's pretty good. Uh, I've been working on this sentence for a week. He goes, a week? He goes, I got 12 words. He goes, what's taking you so long? He says, I'm trying to put them in the right order. Wow. <laughs> so that, that goes along with this next question. And he, he actually said, James Joyce said, it's a curious thing how your mind is super saturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. So there's this old saying that goes, you create what you resist. Or Bob Goldthwaite, the comedian, morphed it into, you are what you hate. And Louis Bunuel said, thank God I'm an atheist. So any comment or thoughts on this line, you create what you resist, or one creates what one resists. Not particularly you, but just this idea that, Well, I think that people who create um, do create out of resistance. Yeah. Not everybody. Some people just create out of joy and skill. Yeah. But many of us have personalities that um, trouble us. <laughs> <laughs> Good laugh. And 
you know, resisting, say, one's own. Well, you can go both ways, you know, resisting one's darkness, say, um, makes you more aware of it and how it interferes with life and, and so on. Um, but you can also resist your darkness and create something bright. You know, Beethoven wrote his, his most um, major key light works when he was most depressed and then his mm -hmm. more serious dark work when he was feeling better. Yeah. But you know about the Russian literature, which I've never delved into, and I wish I knew more about it. Isn't that this deep delve into depression and it's their way of working it out? What is that about? Yeah, the, you know, it's a, it's a culture that's come out of tremendous hardship and stoicism and, um, religiosity you know there was 700 year dark ages like they didn't have a renaissance like you know the west did um so you know dealing a lot with um you know issues of the land and servitude and you know being um kind of chained to the chained to the land in a way that that wasn't happening in in the west for hundreds of years um yeah there's so was that your therapy to work it out no it's it's like printing you know if i gouge a piece of wood because of you know, let's say this was a piece of wood. Where's a piece of wood? If I'm gouging a piece of wood with a chisel, and then I print it, it's going to look like gouged wood. Right. So you take a people who have been, you know, really beaten up, and then you print them, i.e. their art. Yeah. It's going to bear the traces of what they've been through. Yeah. How do you find peace of mind? How? <laughs> I'm still looking. <laughs> um, how do I find peace of mind? It's a very, it's very hard to find when, you know, I'm a very emotionally turbulent person. Um, I find peace of mind. Qigong helps. Yeah. Um, nature. I'm really big on just sitting and looking at trees shift their leaves. Um, I can, you know, I can see becoming one of those old ladies who just sits there and feeds the birds and looks at the birds and being perfectly happy doing that. Um, I draw, you yeah. know, because it gives you a reason to look at to look at something for a long time. I don't mean I'm a good artist, I'm a terrible artist. And what that's part of the peace of mind of it. Unlike being a writer, which I care enormously about the product of that. Art, you know, to draw, to paint for me is pure pleasure because it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be fun. Yeah. And it, and I sit somewhere for a long time. I'm not a super active person, you know, jogging or falling, you know, jumping out of planes and stuff. I just, I don't care for that. Um, but to look at a, a, for a long time and look at those five cypresses and draw them and think about them and feel them and watch them nodding together, and, you know, or anything you look at for a long time. I, I find a, I get a lot of, peace of mind from that beautiful 
If you were walking down the street today, Janet, and you met yourself as a 12 year old, what would you say to your 12 year old self? What would be helpful though? You know, I could say, hang, hang in there, hang in there, you know, but I don't know if that, that would help, help me. I, I would say, hang in there. I would say it gets better eventually. As soon as you get out of the house, you're going to be a lot happier. I could say, uh, you know, and this sounds terrible, but I would say you are special because I was somebody who everybody says you're not special. You're not special. You're not that special. You know, just shut up. Shut up and do what we're telling you to do. Stop complaining. Stop, right? You know, stop talking back. Blah, 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 blah you know. Um, I would whisper in her ear, you know, you are special. Oh, guess man. what? You You do have something in you, you know. And people are going to see that eventually. That would that would make me feel better. That is super special. That really <laughs> that was sweet. And then yeah. you go to the then you go to Social Security or to the to the DMV, and it's like, okay, you are not special. <laughs> <laughs> Jana, just a few more. This has really been fun. I appreciate it. These are five Alan Watts questions in just a few words, just okay. briefly. It's Who's hard for a novelist to be that brief. Yeah, I know, but whatever. It's all right. We'll try. Who started it all? Started it all. Wow. Little Richard. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> I love that. Are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? Oh, you still think? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Good. Yeah. We're going to make it. We might not like it, but we're going to make it. <laughs> Where do we put it? You keep it under your hat. Nice. Who's cleaning it up? Mommy is <laughs> cleaning it up as she always does. Is it serious? Yeah, as as the person who feels rather than thinks, yeah, it is serious. Yeah. Should toilet that that that's done with the Alan Watts. Couple more. Should toilet paper come off the roll over or under? Over. Why? Uh, because it snaps off and doesn't keep rolling. <laughs> if a publisher was to release your autobiography off the top of your head, what would the title be? <laughs> Secrets and Lies. Nice. <laughs> You know, I, I have to tell you, I love when people take the time to think, you know, because we're on this one on one, you know, they feel there there's pressure. And I specifically put that in my suggestions pre-interview, like take all the time you want. Thanks. But with your, with yours, I'd like to do what Harry Shearer did. Edit out for us like an experimental film. Edit out all our non-talking where we're okay. just sitting there going, you know, and there's no sounds. It's really, <laughs> it's really cool. 
you know, because with Zoom, sometimes you go in your thinking and it looks like you may have froze because uh -huh. you know, it has that thing. So I love that you take the time uh, and, and you, you, you know, you take a breath. So the publisher wants to release your autobiography, Secrets and Lies, and they want to scent the glue in the binding. What smell would it be? I think that it would have to be like a kind of a cinnamony, sandality kind of wood, fragrant wood smell. Nice. Tell me something good you never had and you never want. Uh, scuba lessons. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be good. It's learning something. Okay. What's the hell? What's the cultural shift you see developing today that inspires you? There's negative and positive inspiration. Okay, so I'd say that inspires me in one way is um, to get people back into their senses, physical, back into physical reality. People yeah. are crazy because they've been cut off from physical reality too yeah. much. Um, you know, it's easy you know they they just it makes them insane we're animals we're not supposed to spend this much time away from physical reality yeah um so that's the inspiration uh the negative inspiration is that people are spending too much time on screens too much time divorced from one another too much time uh away from nature uh inside in denatured environments and the positive um i'm inspired by um the possibilities for innovation of trying something new um uh, of communication at a distance so the very thing that i'm i'm trying to ameliorate with the senses i also appreciate that i can you know talk to you see your face see your place have a class where people are taking it from new york and yeah. st louis and like some tiny town in alabama and also from prague and you know that we can all gather together in a space and do something interesting yeah it's good that we call that services and disservices because the phenomenon is i you know met at beyond baroque and had these discussions for years in the gallery and now i have them on zoom and i probably will never return to doing them live because i have people all over the world. No one has to drive and park. They don't have to walk up the stairs. They're more present. That's the big one. People are more present because we're just staring at each other's faces. In the room, we... So I love the live experience. I've delved into it my whole life. And for two years in COVID, I still rode my bike down to the beach every day and saw my friends and talked even though a lot of people's like, I'm not even going out. So it's, it is a, a push and pull struggle indeed. And how, you know, television telephones have taken over. This is, or really what we are, we're doing right now is called live TV. Yeah. It's broadcast a lot worldwide live TV. So that was really beautiful. And I just have a couple more. And it's funny because your book was called secrets and lies. When Joseph Boyce, the artist, said, make the secrets productive. Lou Welsh was a beat poet and an ad man. 
He said, guard the secrets, constantly reveal them. But it was Thornton Wilder in 1928. He said, art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one's secret. It's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. Yeah. So you've, you've laid your cards on the table for over 90 minutes, Janet. I'm not insinuating you haven't answered this. But what's it really all about for you? I got to say making friends. I just love to make friends. I like other people. I'm a, yeah. I love that. <laughs> making friends. How simple. Wait, you're a novelist. You're supposed to use a lot of words. You would, you know, you really have a sense of how to talk in short phrases, but also to stretch it out and explain it. You know, it's like you have both. It's pretty, it's been pretty enlightening for me to hear you. Uh, in the, Such a pleasure. You, well, no, you're a successful writer because you're a, you're, you're a successful conversationalist and, and articulate. I appreciate it. My so, favorite, thing. My favorite yeah. thing in the world is a good conversation. Yeah. yeah, really. So last question, Janet, and I hope this never ends. Um, what gives you the most optimism? Human kindness. Yeah. Seeing somebody kind, you know, you're walking down the street and you see, you know, somebody with their dog and the dog's like sitting quietly watching the person, you know, that there's a good communication or you see some, somebody helping their mother, grandmother, or somebody, you know, helping them into the store or something yeah. like that. You know, these little moments of kindness just make me, you know, uh, keep me from despair. Yeah, I agree. It's funny because that was the question they asked Groucho Marx at the end of his life. They said, what gives you the most optimism? And he said, other people. And, you know, you just said making friends, human kindness. You started what, what's the best thing for a human is love. So I really appreciate this. It's truly been lovely. And I love you, Janet. Oh, so much fun. So much fun. Thank you so much. And even though I'm going to hit the end broadcast button, I do hope this conversation will go on, on and on for infinity. Thank, Thank you. you.